Welcome to another edition of SME Media Webinar. Our topic today is Connected Factories. More specifically, how to survive and scale in the age of disruption. The webinar is sponsored by Tulip, which was spun off from MIT in 2017 to help companies equip frontline workers to improve pr productivity, quality, and efficiency. Tulip has received numerous industry awards, including Frost & Sullivan's Entrepreneurial Company of the Year, and was recognized as a World Economic Forum Global Innovator. Our presenters today are Russ Waddell, Community Lead for Tulip, who is joined by Sophia Barron, a Continuous Improvement Engineer at Stanley Brett Black & Decker. Russ joined Tulip earlier this year after 15 years with AMT, the Association for Manufacturing Technology, where he most recently managed the MT Connect Institute. He has an economics degree from <clears throat> the College of William & Mary, Sevilla is a responsible for analyzing Black & Decker's manufacturing processes and identifying opportunities for improvement. The goal is to connect technology within operations to solve problems. Russ and Sophia, take it away. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate the kind introduction. Thank you to SME for hosting. And of course, thank you to my co-presenter, Sophia. Uh, it's great to have you here and I look forward to our conversation. So the, the overview today, We've got a brief agenda and a lot of discussion about what's going on on the factory floor. This is very much a, an engineering focused presentation. We're gonna frame the conversation starting with the state of things today, what manufacturing looks like now, um, what's going well, some of the big challenges. Um, we're gonna talk about shifting to what we call a composable approach. So this is something that uh, is not necessarily tulip specific, but the, a, a mega trend that you really need to know about as you're looking for future factory applications, digitization efforts, and kind of taking industry to the next level. I'll avoid as much as possible other buzzwords for that type of stuff. Uh, you can all bring your own and imagine what those might what those might be. And the last piece is we want to get into exactly what Sophia is doing uh, at Stanley Black & Decker, what she's doing in the continuous improvement role, what that actually looks like day to day, uh, and some of the ways that she's living it, so I'm not just telling you about it. Sophia, uh, thanks a lot for taking the time today. Before we get into the state of manufacturing, I do want to spend just a quick minute uh, letting the audience get to know a little bit more about what your day-to-day -day is and who you are. So tell me, where are you joining us from and, and what do you do in a typical day? Of course. So thank you for having me. My name is Sophia. I'm a continuous improvement engineer here at Stanley Black & Decker. I work for one of their brands called Lista. My day-to-day is just finding improvements within our processes. And I started my career last year in May as, um, as I graduated with a mechanical engineering background as well as a physics background. I really didn't know what my role entailed up until I found Tulip, honestly, because Tulip has got, kind of given me the leverage to see my vision for the plant. So ever since I got introduced to Tulip, my goal is to transform our departments into a digital factory. So kind of connecting our processes together and kind of giving everybody out on the floor the tools that they need for us to succeed. So you're uh, you're doing a cont continuous improvement as your job function and Tulip is a core tool for you to build apps and interfaces and connect to devices and processes. Is that about how you describe it? Absolutely. I think that is like my biggest role, but I wear a lot of hats in the companies as well, in the company as well. Like I deal with like a lot of projects. If our paint system goes down, um, where are we going to deploy our, our product? Like what suppliers are we going to use? That's something I deal with every day. But for the majority, I do go out on the floor. I talk with employees all the time and I kind of try to transform what they're doing now to a digital form um, and kind of training them on how to use it, applying new features to my apps. So that is a big majority of my day. I do have, I do have a question for you just to kick us off on day-to-day uh, -day challenges. It's 2022. We're kind of coming out of COVID and some kind of weird years, but I have a supply chain question just to kind of kick it off with a really hard one. Are there material shortages and supply chain issues that you're still dealing with now, first of all, and was there ever a time when you weren't dealing with those issues? Yeah, so when I 
heard about this question. I did like a big talk with the employees here at Lista. And of course, supply chain pre-COVID was built on long-term relationships, loyalty, quality expect expectations were very high and time deliveries were really strict. And although we do have some excellent suppliers, of course, COVID affected these factors very negatively. But after speaking with our team, one of the most things that resonated was, with us was the shortage of truck drivers which of course affected delivery time. So we haven't really suffered from the quality aspect of things, but time delivery is definitely not what it used to be. And I have very low, uh, very low experience in supply chain, but I can speak to material shortages like within the process. So we have the product here in the plant, but when one process is waiting for material from another process, that's where we are the most disconnected. So that's kind of where I stepped in and tried to digitally connect everything so that we know visually where the product stands at all times. Are you optimistic about that stuff getting untangled or is it just gonna be straight from truck driver shortage to skilled worker shortage to material shortage to one thing after another? I think I'm optimistic about the future of manufacturing, but I think everyone kind of has to be on the same page and kind of realize that as a manufacturing plant, we do deal with so many challenges and we do have so much like skilled labor shortages, um, material shortages that we kind of have to have a plan for. So going back to like labor shortages, that's one of our main problems here in this plan, we're always far behind. And one of the main reasons is, well, we're lacking people. But many of our operators here at Stanley, they have been with the company for more than a decade and or more than a decade or two, and they're slowly approaching retirement. So the manufacturing plant is just all they know and what they have a passion for. And they've gained so much experience and so much tribal knowledge that as a company, we never really captured. Um, so when it comes time to replace them, I think candidates are getting harder to find. I think newcomers um, are less enthusiastic about manual labor, which makes employee engagement difficult. And not only just like manual labor that goes into making our product, but the manual labor as in like grabbing the paperwork for the day, um, delivering paperwork, making sure you find your product within our inventory system. And we have 15,000 parts. So learning what those 15,000 parts are, it's very hard. So I think as we're losing experienced workers, um, we are losing a lot of that tribal knowledge within the factory. And like I said, we've gone years without capturing it. So I think from a leadership standpoint, it's time to capture things um, digitally, whether it be training um, or just an app that kind of shows everybody the schedule rather than chasing down paperwork. Technology is just right in front of us and I think we really need to leverage the power of it. And the people part is really important because right now the labor market is really, really tight and hiring across the board is incredibly difficult. There's tons of pressure on uh, wages because of inflation, but there was even before we had runaway inflation, there was still lots of upward pressure on wages. People just, like you said, they don't want to do work that they don't have to do if it's, you know, unpleasant in any any way or it's not at home, et cetera. That's a turn off to wanting to do that work, and that but that that's going to ebb and flow, right? So if that's the situation that things are now, if we enter a recession, there'll be more people available to work. And I think one of the things that's that's frustrating from a from a fitting like from an engineering perspective where you're trying to build good robust reliable systems for manufacturing and those systems are you know people and equipment and processes trying to do that in a way that that is flexible to where it can accept people coming and going and skills coming and going and uh the tribal not the conversation about tribal knowledge being passed to the next person you know i'm not I haven't been doing this for, for forever, but that's at least a, the entire time I've been in the industry, it's been a conversation about how you capture and codify and pass on tribal knowledge. So putting the, the person in the middle is a big factor that I think hasn't seen, well, hasn't seen until somewhat recently a whole lot of uh, movement in terms of how software systems and computers and 
the technology that we, we deal with every single day and the rest of our non-manufacturing life actually coming to fruition inside good manufacturing systems that also fit the rest of the needs of of manufacturing so let me ask you a question here what how have you seen this have you seen both in terms of what you're being asked to do and where you think things are going what's the what's the person who's really enjoying their work on the floor going to look like in the future and what's going to give them power and enjoyment out of their work so i think what a lot of my work resonates with is i just want the employee the operator to feel like they have a say in their everyday job to feel like they're winning every day um so right now what our factory workers do is just they produce product but they're not 24 7 producing product while they're here because from another process, they might be missing that product. So they'll go look for that product. And if they can't find that product, then they have to communicate to another employee, hey, I'm missing this part. Um, can you go find it? Do you know where it is? So it's a lot of communicating. It's a lot of miscommunication. And I feel like when they can't find that part that they're looking for, and then someone comes to them and says, hey, you didn't produce this part and we're waiting for it in the paint line, why is that? I think they feel as if they've failed in a way. So in my vision, like in an ideal world, I think an operator should never leave their station because everything that, that they need to complete their everyday job is already right there. They access their schedule online. They report missing parts online. They communicate online. And also they kind of have some kind of metric such to say you've completed all you had to do today and there should be like a reward, not a reward at the end, but there should be a sense of like, Hey, I'm, I actually completed my job today and I can go up to my supervisors and leads and tell them, Hey, I completed this. What's next. What do you want me to do? Um, so I think right now we're really lacking that employee, satisfaction where they feel like they're winning in their everyday life. And as I've gotten further into Tulip, I um, I always try to tell them like this tool is for us to build the metrics for not only like the plant, but for the department, the employee as a whole, so that we can sit down at like annual reviews and say, hey, over this past time, this is like how you've performed and these were the expectations and you exceeded our expectations. So I think, I think Tulip will definitely leverage us to become more successful and make our employee feel like they are winning and no longer have to guess whether or not they're doing a good job within the department. I sometimes feel like manufacturing software is at this state where we're handing people a screwdriver asking them to pound in the nail with it and then getting upset with them when they don't do a good job and like there's no reason that there isn't the right tool for the job in software like the, it's the technology exists it's just getting it into the hands of the people that can can do something with it and productizing it to where you know we've actually i guess invented the hammer for, for nails oh exactly i think a lot of the times like we're in a we're in a stage like 2022, we're in a position where we kind of just take employees and we hire them, we lead them to their station and we say, here's your everyday job and this is what's expected from you. But there's no way of you knowing whether or not you're doing a good job. You're doing what's expected for you. How do you know that you've gone the extra mile, you know? Um, so there's like a miscommunication on first shift and second shift. First shift will always say that they're doing more than second shift. But th before Tulip, there wasn't any way to kind of prove that, you know, because it was all on paper. We had no hours associated with how much each employee has worked, how much each department has worked. So, yeah, definitely. I might be torturing a metaphor here again, but I feel like the first and second shift is also applicable when we're talking about this idea of composability, because you, there is no, you don't just have a production operation. You have pieces of that that then add up to what the operation is. So you have, you have a, a machine, you have a cell, you have a plant, you have shifts within the plant. 
and and you can subdivide things to to basically make parts or make product in all these different ways and what's what's really fascinating and sometimes frustrating and and feels a little bit crazy is that the ways to break up a system and then attack that system for the sake of manufacturing productivity you know that's super well established that's that's been more or less the same set of approaches since the industrial revolution and it's the stuff you learn about when you're taking engineering classes and the stuff that you learn about when learning about what what it means to be part of the, the means of and modes of production and then there's there's it falls down uh because we still haven't gotten to where you layer on top of the existing good processes and systems here is software and it systems that will actually work within within that environment and i think that's the piece where i'm almost i'm sort of jealous of jealous of where you're starting out because you get to come in here and like you don't have the conversation about whether you know whether paper or digital is you know whether, whether there's room for digital. Like I remember when there was a conversation where it, w- it was just, there's no room for digital. We will always use paper until the last dog dies and that will just be the way it is. And I don't think that that's the way it is anymore. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm sure there are some people that still want paper, but I don't I don't think that the quite the backwardness that, that it was not so long ago is, is still there. Yeah, I think it takes the right person with the right approach for a digital factory to inspire other people in the factory that this is possible, this is the future, this is a lot better. I mean, it's one thing to take a app and implement it in a floor and they're all just kind of like, hey, this is nothing we can work with because it just doesn't resonate with our everyday life. Um, It's not applicable to what we do, but I think I, I say I because I'm the only one kind of implementing Tulip. I think I've learned the right approach to implement this these apps into our department. And everybody has been super um, supportive of it and they all love it. And I Tulip actually went down on one station Well, it was like an internet problem, but Tulip went down on one station the other day and I got a message in the morning and everybody was kind of like freaking out because they can no longer see the schedule. They can no longer record themselves doing anything. They can no longer get that metric for that hour that the internet was down. So it kind of goes to show like everybody relied on paper and everyone will slowly start to rely on digital platforms. Um, and I told them, Hey, we're going to run into this issue, but this is us just starting out. And I'm glad that everyone said like, Oh, we're going to lose all these metrics. I'm glad I didn't hear. Oh, this is why we should stick to paper. (laughs) That's exactly what I didn't want to hear. And every time we have one of those issues, like, Oh, the internet went down in one station, we run off of ethernet. So it's very reliable, but someone actually unplugged like the ethernet cable. So that's kind of why we went down in that station. So it's very rare to happen. But I always start off by saying this is not Tulip. This is not because we went digital. Um, this is just like a simple problem that we're going to have to fix. But just like we put a machine into a department, if that machine goes down, then yeah, of course, we're going to have to f- face the consequences. Same as like Tulip. If Tulip goes down, we're going to face the comp consequences and we're going to fix it we're not just going to give up yeah i like that i like that model of, of approaching software and i keep saying software but it's really it's software plus networking plus data management um plus storage plus a cloud infrastructure all that stuff together is really the system that i'm talking about and and understanding that those pieces interplay but also that we're not, this is we're not making this up from scratch. This is something that we already did for physical equipment for a long time, and moving that to whatever the, the latest and most interesting and most powerful tool for the job is, as a class and as individual pieces of software. I think that that's a really important place to be going, and it's a good grounding. Is that we're not making all of this up from scratch. Let's let's work on the problems that are new and unique, and let's not assume that we're inventing a whole new set of problems every time we try and do this. So I, that conversation comes up all the time, talking with with manufacturers across the board, in just like a huge a huge swath of space. That I think we're the composability thing, and to use the paper example, like I, I think 
I like paper still, but only for certain things and only when it's tied back to the rest of the system, right? So if I have a QR code on a piece of paper that's a job traveler or on a label that sticks on to a part, that's a completely different situation than if the only source of truth is that piece of paper. And if I'm hand scribbling notes on a traveler and that traveler goes from station to station and because it's getting notes on at each station, it's out of date at every station, that's a completely different system than assuming that paper is a critical piece of this of this system, but also having an easy, fast way to get those notes back into whatever the system of record is and have that system of record not just be the access point for whoever was scratching notes on it. And that that type of thinking is getting more common across manufacturing from from the engineering level, from the plant management level, from the operator level. Everyone is starting to get that. And I think composability is just kind of a fancy word for talking about that design principle where we say we, we're not killing paper to kill paper because digital is better. We are moving to digital where digital fits. We know that paper will, you know, will be a critical piece of the of the process or sticky notes will be a critical piece or pick your thing will be a critical piece. But we, we also build around that piece with the rest of the digital infrastructure to make it so that that piece is doing the thing it's best at, which is it's right there. I can pick it up and stick it on something else and I can scribble a note on it with a pen and then don't stress that component of the system beyond what it's actually good at. So I don't know. That, I feel like I feel like we're making good progress there. Yes. And also, like when we transformed our schedule digitally, um, one of the main concerns was, well, what if there is a ethernet problem or something like that. Well, there's always a backup. Like you can always print the schedule and give it to the operator. Luckily we haven't gotten to that point, but I think it's good to remind people that we have a backup. Um, just like if a machine goes down, we have a backup machine. And if that machine goes down and that's two machines have gone down. So we have to really think what do we do in that case? So I don't think we're ever going to run into an issue where we can't print out the schedule or access the schedule online. That's right. But there's also there's always a backup. And that's just like everyone's scared of trying something new. And that's why they kind of just have to try it, give it a chance, don't give up. Yeah, exactly. And understanding that the ability to pursue the best in class for whatever the function is, is dependent on having a little bit of flexibility about you know what you're willing to do and and to not throw away if if what we have is an amazingly good highly manual process but it's super reliable and we really want that to be secure and reliable don't kill the manual process for the sake of digitization but if we can catalog some component of the manual process or automate some piece of that manual process you know that might take place first in just your process audit that might take place just in the inventory control but knowing that there is both a person and the software and the infrastructure behind it to slot all that in into a wider system that's not just sophia built a one-off for this particular operator at this particular time on this particular part and being able to scale all that stuff up together with the the you know kind of invisible stuff that goes behind it to make that possible oh definitely i want to talk about some examples of uh, what you guys have done. So we have a, we have a little bit more to cover on uh, kind of the old way versus the new way, but let's talk specifically about where you guys are going. We covered, you know, the old way of paper and then your process definition and then the execution of that process to get to value. And we talked about how bundling that stuff up into one person or one silo or one department creates a high cost of implementation and a low ability to adjust on the fly. The flip side of that, of course, is if you have high ability to adjust on the fly, that can potentially create a large amount of complexity and sophistication that then requires maintenance that wasn't necessarily available before. And when I say maintenance, I'm not talking about just machine maintenance of equipment necessarily. I'm talking about process maintenance and like system maintenance of the IT systems, the connections between the IT systems and the factory equipment, and the maintenance of the, the people and processes that keep those things going. But that stuff, that stuff should all be done here at this bottom layer where we call it the centralized data model, microservices, and edge connectivity. And that's the stuff that you, Sophia, the continuous improvement person, shouldn't have to be worrying about on a daily basis. You may, ha you may have input to how that looks and, and as you pull from it, what's going well, what's going poorly, what needs some improvement, but that stuff feeds back into your into your underlying infrastructure, and you instead get to build, you know, apps and individual solutions and uh, 
kind of like this web of of nodes of better better fixes wherever you can find them and you're not having to do a, a giant project every single time you do that so talk, talk about your workflow as you get you know build a quick fix into something maybe the the button example we were just talking about um before the call yeah of course so tulip is kind of gives me like the ability of like low code no code skills and like although i do have coding skills i don't think i have like the patience to code java or python in the background so i'm very grateful that i do have a tool where i can kind of just build apps but feel as if i am just like super powerful and developing something so great so you're so right all of that like bottom layer that's already done for. So now I can just build onto it. Um, so one of the things that makes Tulip so great is when I'm out on the floor, a lot of operators kind of tell me, so now that I've built their trust and I've kind of implemented Tulip in the background where they kind of did transform their schedules digitally and now they can access everything on their workstation, um, if they are missing a part from that schedule, what they used to do is fill out a paper form of exactly what they're missing with the part number, the quantity, um, the document name, the week and the day they're working on, from what station it's coming from, the name, the date. So all of this filling, filling out paperwork and bringing it upstairs to the programmer, it takes about five minutes or two to five minutes depending because not everyone is familiar with all the information coming like from that part. So what they asked me to do was, hey, it would be so great. And I already was kind of thinking about this in the background, but I wasn't trying to overwhelm the department with too much features like, OK, this is the schedule and this is where you request missing parts. I kind of want to have a slow approach to it because it is so new and I want everyone to be comfortable, um, give me feedback. So when I heard that they wanted a missing part button, I was like, well, I already know exactly what I'm going to do and it's going to be so easy. It's going to take me like an hour to do. So um, when they asked me for that, I got into my office and I built it right away where they look at their schedule, they select the job, and they're able to submit a missing part that goes directly to the programmer. And it takes all that schedule information as well as like the logged in user, the date that they're working on, and sends it up to um, our programmer and he's able to see the missing part right away. And what he's been doing is nesting it and reprogramming reprogramming it on one of our turret machines to get punched. So then when when he does that, it's flagged like status in process. So when it's missing, it's flagged red. So no one's going to start that job because that part is missing. No one's going to waste time going to look for it. Um, and when it's in process, we've trained our workers to for the turret operators to deliver it directly to that station because now they are able to print the missing part document from their station to deliver it to like that operator that requested it. So it's like a very, very good flow and it's something that the operators have wanted. So when I implemented it, everyone is just, they're, they're so happy that they no longer have to fill out that paperwork and waste their time going upstairs and getting that, um, paperwork lost and I implemented that. And of course, like the next question is why is it missing? I thought about including why is it missing? Is it damaged? Is it missing from like the turret machines? Is it missing from another process? Just kind of like tying everything together because obviously you want to build those metrics. How many non-conforming parts did you have this month from this process, et cetera. And I was also thinking that in the background and the other day an operator actually came up to me saying, hey, I always request missing parts um, and I don't wanna look bad, but it's because they're actually missing and it looks like I'm damaging them. So can I have an option where I actually put in that I'm missing them from like the turret machine? So as I build more features onto the app, I get more requests from operators just kind of saying, hey, this would be great 
in the app. So can you please like include that in? And then the next day when it's there, um, they get so excited about it because they're like, oh, that was my idea. Even though I had these ideas flowing, they initiated me to do it because they wanted it. So I think like from an app standpoint, the fact that I'm here in the plant and they want something added in and they can come talk to me directly and then have it available the next day. That's what makes like citizen development so powerful. It's funny, you said something in there, you said the next day when the feature is in there. You you mean literally the next day. That's not that's not a figure of speech. Yeah, sometimes. I know once I um put Tulip in a bunch of stations. Right now it's running in six stations in, de in our department and one out of five of our departments. So I feel like I just owe everything to that department because they have made my job so rewarding. So when they do give me like, hey, I want that missing part button and I think it's pretty easy, then yeah, I'm going to do it right away. I'm going to like not right away, maybe the next like day or two. Um, but I have had some requests that are far more complex that I jot down the note and I say, okay, when I have time, I will do this. So not everything gets done right away, but like the small things definitely do get done right away because it's just the matter of me sitting on my Tulip app and publishing a new version for an hour. And the next day is just me going around making sure everyone's okay with it. It's just, I think if there's one takeaway for the people that are in the audience, that if you leave with nothing else, the, the expectations from manufacturing software at this point in time should be what, what Sophia is describing here, right? It's, it's, a, it's an overnight thing. It's the person who's there. It's the person who can see the process and talk to the people that own the process. And it's not, it's not let's do a five-figure change order and wait a matter of weeks to get this stuff done. Um, like there's, there's a place for that kind of, you know, big software and big projects to exist, but we're, we're never going to realize what it ought to look like to have a digital factory or anything even close to that unless we, we shrink down the size of those transactions from, you know, from here's the problem to here's the fix. We just, we have to make that faster and it's, it's possible now and you shouldn't really be like willing to accept incredibly long timelines and, and high dollar costs to get small things baked into some future weeks off release or, or months off release that's pushed from the from the vendor so thank you for the commercial sophia i appreciate that <laughs> no problem so let's talk let's talk a little bit more about you know what stanley black black and decker look like where are you guys on the journey um are you are you early along are you far along what's the context into which all this stuff gets installed give people a little bit more to think about in terms of how this would apply to them and you know how this is maybe not unique to your company um, and your specific experience so we've got um, kind of like what things look like previously and this is your plan right a lot of manual data um, there wasn't connectivity necessarily set up to any system that was centralized that stuff is now being chipped away at or it's still in the roadmap or it's mostly done what's the what's kind of the status based on the plan that somewhat predated you to where we are today okay so this might be a lengthy response but first i want to summarize what we do here so at lista which is a brand of stanley black and decker we manufacture high density um storage solution that help our customers work more efficiently we partner with like a variety of businesses that design customized storage um to maximize productivity so these cabinets that you see they come very modular you can customize them to any color any size any amount of drawers and so we are a custom order make to order company which we have so many parts flowing through um our plants so when i first started as a full time, we would go to daily gamma meetings, which is just a walk throughout your plant, um, throughout the five departments that we have, um, detail fab, drawer line, housing line, paint and assembly. And we would walk around and talk about where are we um, as a company? How far along is our department? Are we winning or losing? How much product did we produce, et cetera? So, answering those questions like hearing the supervisors answers those questions i was kind of like where how do you know how do you know that we did three thousand parts today how 
how do you know? So when I asked um, them that question, I started my project off in Detail Fab. It was kind of just a whole month of learning that department, like not doing anything in my office, just out on the floor, learning the schedule, talking with operators. And I asked the team lead to kind of lead me through, how do you know that you did 3,000 parts? Because you reported that you did 3,000 parts, so let me see the process. So he walked around every single station, which is about 16 in that department, and manually counted up on a calculator on paperwork, line by line, there's like 50 lines on each schedule, line by line of all the parts complete. So. I wish we had a, um, a schedule here of our plant, but we should have added that in there. But he basically counted up everything manual and then he reported it out like three hours later when we did Gamba. So I was like, well, how do you know that that employee actually completed that job? Well, because he crossed it off and put his initials on it. So I was like, okay, well, um, how do you know, like, just how do you know? How do you trust that that employee did that? And then the paperwork after a week gets put into a drawer and then we have like assembly saying that they're missing a part from that previous week. So then we'll go back to the paperwork and be like, nope, it, it was crossed off, like it's been done. So that's kind of how we accounted for stuff. But now when I implemented Tulip, I kind of, started um, at the schedule level. I was like, what's the best way to make sure that everybody uses Tulip? And it's kind of just implementing our schedule into a digital form. So now our schedulers upload directly to the Tulip table through SAP of everything we need to do that day. And the operators log into their workstation and they're able to see everything they do. So they select the job, they start the job, they stop the job, they put in the quantity complete. And this um, this job will have their names associated with it, the date it's been completed, how long it took, how much they completed it. So a lot of the times, like if they do complete five out of 10 parts, obviously that job is incomplete. So it'll be flagged incomplete in our system. And then I did a supervisor dashboard. So everything that the supervisor was reporting out in Gamba meetings, I put into a digital form. So I'm like, okay, from now on, everything is live in your department. It took us a while to get there, but now I can start building the supervisor dashboard where um, it's already built, but where you can log in and see exactly where your plan is at. So you did 3000 parts that day and that is 100% certain because now it's recorded on Tulip and everything is interconnected. So that saves our team lead from walking around every single station and counting up parts manually. So we no longer release our paperwork out on the floor. Um, so that concludes one department, which is Detail Fab, and we have four more departments to go. So I think we are in the very early stages of kind of transforming to a digital factory. My goal, my vision is for us to be interconnected as a whole. Right now, we know exactly what's happening in Detail Fab. So when they report their numbers, I feel confident. But when other departments um, report their numbers, obviously I'm gonna question them because they aren't digital. So are they walking around and manually counting um, parts that they've made? Probably, are they like trusting our employees way too much? Even though obviously our employees are very trustful, but you can't hold anybody accountable because nothing is really connected to their name. Um, so we are in the early stages, but I do believe that I won't lose the momentum to kind of get us to where I want us to be and kind of interconnect everything digitally. So my next department is probably going to be assembly. I want to start at the beginning, which was Zeta Fab, and I want to then go to assembly, which is at the end, just because a lot of our missing parts come from Detail Fab. So now we have a now we have everything live in Detail Fab. So I think it would be great for assembly to see to go into detail fab schedule and be like, oh, this part hasn't been made, that's why it's missing. So kind of just connecting everything um, so that we no longer have to question 
our gambas and question exactly where our plan is at. When you ask those, when you ask the how do you know questions and the measurement questions and the visibility questions, do you feel like you hit dead, end, dead, dead ends or do you feel like you get to good answers or do you feel like there's just more questions? What, like what's the, what's the end game when you start asking that? It feels kind of like the five whys, you know? Yeah, so every time I tell um, the supervisors of Detail Fab that I'm done with my tulip journey with that department, I always have more questions. So there are so many bottlenecks that we found by going digital because we found that we were, I could go into so many details, but we found that we were just like miscommunicating with the scheduling team with our employees out on the floor. Um, if our scheduling team had a canceled order, they would email that this order is canceled. But where do we communicate that out to the floor that they no longer have to produce those parts? Now it's kind of like my responsibility to go into Tulip and delete those jobs so that they no longer have to do them or adjust the quantity. Um, so I think like the opportunity when you go digital in, in a department never stops and the questions never stop and you're never going to hit perfect because you're just going to want to know more and more and more. Um, so, yeah. Give me, okay, we have a bunch of questions, so I want to make sure we get time to answer most of those. Um, we covered the missing materials app. Um, did we do the Kanban cards yet? You didn't talk about that one, did you? I have not. So the way our company, the way our plant runs is we used to have a Kanban process in place. Um, and right now it kind of fell through because we're, we went off of Kanban cards. So there was no trigger. If a Kanban card gets lost, you have to obviously reprint that. You have to retrain people. So I kind of I don't know too much detail about my Kanban journey, but I think that's the next step. That's why I want to move on from Detail Fab, but Detail Fab has like 300 parts on Kanban right now that I want to minimize. And I also want to tie in with the schedule and the inventory in Detail Fab. So I think kind of going a digital route for Kanban would be amazing because if you're low on inventory, you can see it on your end in your office. I haven't put too much thought into it, but just recently this week, I have been thinking about doing a Kanban project within Tulip and kind of tying it into everything we do have um, working in our detail fab in the digital aspect of things. Awesome. The first question we have is actually super closely related to that and the job schedule the job scheduler but it's more on the it's on the erp side so what's the erp that you're using and what's what's the erp you're using it sounds like that was sap right yes and then so how how tightly are tulip and sap integrated for you all and what was the process like what were the learnings from doing that integration so we use the sap p10 so currently our scheduler actually downloads um, the schedule from SAP to an Excel file. And the way we run is by week and by day. And COVID times has put us so far behind that we're actually not on the calendar week we are supposed to be. That's why we have to put in the week and the day into our Tulip table in order for my app to kind of filter it out. Um, because we are so far behind, but I've talked with like a lot of Tulip reps and they say you can integrate Tulip and SAP directly where you wouldn't even need a scheduler to upload anything into your Tulip app and it kind of just does it automatically. Um, but we haven't gotten there because we are so far behind, so we kind of have to do it manually in our case. So it's just whatever works for you and your plan if you are on the calendar week and if you're not a make to order company um i think it would be easy for you to integrate your erp with tulip yeah i mean quick technical detail on that the the question around sap and any erp integration is what are the endpoints that you're making available so from whatever the back end database for the erp is there is 
there has to be an endpoint available, whether that's native in the ERP or whether that's some piece of middleware that's that's making access available. And that's true to integrate anything with that ERP. So if you have a if you have a great set of integrations, you already have things integrated to the ERP, that's kind of one building an integration path. If you have more or less a walled off, fully standalone, nothing touches it um, ERP system. That means that it's tougher to integrate anything, and Tulip faces the same challenge as anything else trying to get into that into that integration. So, I mean, we talk to customers about this on a very regular basis, um, as far as what do they have now in terms of access points to any uh, any other tool that's going to need data out of the ERP, and it's a it's a very frustrating process because the the ERP wasn't necessarily built with API access to it in mind. Um, and that's only something that's kind of like ramping up uh, semi recently as more and more customers start asking for it. So press everybody across the board as far as the vendors go and what's the integration look like because you know you're going to have to integrate it with something else. Like there's there's never a time when key, key information about sales isn't going to need to be uh, or orders isn't going to need to be integrated back to production. So I, I get frustrated about that all the time. And where it gets fixed is one of the places where I feel like there's the most opportunity um, in the industry. Enough of a soapbox for me. Next question, I think this one's for you as well. Have you leveraged highly skilled operators in app development specifically? The person asking the question specifically says they've got a small team of their top performers uh, and they're specifically tasked with gaining buy-in from the immediate department and then actually building the applications out themselves. Um, so I think before I got into app building, I really learned the company. I learned the plant I, and then I learned the department. I learned exactly what they're doing now and I transformed it digitally without making a lot of changes. My app right now, you look at the schedule and you start your job, you stop your job, you put in the quantity complete, That's ex and you sign your initials. That's exactly what you're doing on an app, but now it's on, at your workstation. So I started very simply um, because a lot of people, yeah, they have been working there for years. They didn't want to go digital, but once they found the simplicity of the app, they were more than willing to give it a try and use it every day. And then at one point we just gave them no choice but to use it every day because we t we gave them two weeks to get used to the app as well as, uh, as well as paperwork. So they had it hand in hand. So I saw a lot of people comparing the paperwork to what Tulip said and I, and I would just kind of be like, well guys, it's everything um, that you guys see on paperwork is now digital, like no changes, no nothing. So I kept it very simple and I think what got me to where I am today is I started building more and more, um, more and more features onto the app by just asking operators, what do you want to see in it? What will help you? Because I'm not standing there every day. So what I think is best might not be what they think is best, but I try to really make them be my number one customer. Um, and that's kind of how I buy, get their buy-in. There's a super direct question about digitization here. Um, the, Basically, the question is, do you deal differently with somebody who's spent you know, most of their career dealing with paper as opposed to somebody who is a digital native and just grew up with computers and cell phones and everything else? Yeah, I do hear a lot of comments like from younger um, employees that, oh, this is so much easier. Um, like, I, I'm happy we went this route. And... I honestly got very good feedback from like older employees as well, just because it makes their, the way our department runs, it's like 15,000 moving parts. Um, so you can't keep track of everything, especially when two employees are working on the same schedule at the same time during first shift and then second shift comes in and they're working on the same schedule again. So I think honestly, I haven't had really much different opinions from older and younger generation. I think they both are very welcoming to the change just because it makes their life a lot easier. Uh, okay, there's not much time left. We got one question left I think we can get to. Um, 
this one's straightforward. Did you immediately start to implement changes to the apps following operators' feedback? Um, I would not say immediately. I let them have like about two weeks of just getting used to the app. And then I made a lot of notes of things that they would want me to change. And then I guess it was kind of immediate because I just wanted their buy-in so bad that I just kind of took their input and I ran with it. I didn't I didn't leave them unhappy. I just I knew this was a big change, so I just wanted to make them happy and just kind of improve my app by implementing a lot of their changes. Sophia, thank you so much for taking the time to put all this together and share a lot about what you've been working on. It's been an absolutely wonderful educational experience for me to hear uh, what you've been up to. It's exciting to think about what's coming next and I hope to, to hear more in the future. Thanks again to SME for hosting uh, and that's gonna do it for us.